Ah, well, welcome everyone to Wednesday night at the lab. My name is Carol McCartney, and I'm the outreach manager at Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey, which is part of UW Extension Cooperative Extension. On behalf of half of the Biotech Center, UW Extension Cooperative Extension, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, UW-Madison Science Alliance, and standing in for our vacationing Tom Zinnen, I thank you for coming out tonight to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to my colleagues at the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey, Grace Graham and Sue Swanson. Grace has been a geologist at the survey since 2014, primarily working on inventorying and monitoring springs in Wisconsin. She has visited hundreds of springs around the state. Her work is focused on describing the physical and hydrological characteristics of springs, but she has growing interest in studying their ecological functions as well. Grace was born in Ohio. She graduated from Cleveland Heights High School and received a bachelor's degree in environmental geology from Beloit College. Her connection, perhaps, to Sue Swanson. Dr. Sue Swanson is a professor of geology and Weeks chair in the physical and human geography at Beloit College. She was born in Illinois where she graduated from Crystal Lake High School. She attended Gustavus Adolf Adolphus College in Minnesota, after which she was in the US Peace Corps in Lesotho. She's a graduate of the UW-Madison Water Resource Management Program and has a PhD from UW-Madison in hydrogeology. At Beloit College, Dr. Swanson teaches courses in environmental geology, hydrogeology, geomorphology, and geographic information systems. Her research focuses on groundwater and surface water interactions and the hydrogeology of spring systems, including investigations of landscape and aquifer conditions that promote spring formation and affect the quality of spring water. And she's a research associate at the Wisconsin Geological Survey. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Grace Graham and Sue Swanson. Well, thank you, Carol, and thanks to all of you for coming out tonight to uh, listen to um, our work on springs in Wisconsin. We're really excited to share this with you. Um, before I get started, I wanted to just take a second um, to highlight some of the ways in which um, work at places like the University of Wisconsin um, and uh, work at private colleges in Wisconsin complement one another. So, um, you know, I'm from Beloit College, but Carol mentioned I got uh, my graduate degrees here at University of Wisconsin-Madison, went on to Beloit, um, where, of course, I met Grace. Uh, Grace, in turn, graduated and is now working at the Wisconsin Geological Natural History Survey. So certainly within our own project, there are some interesting connections, but, but it actually goes back much further. Um, some of you may know of uh, T.C. Chamberlain. Uh, Chamberlain. Chamberlain was a president of the University of Wisconsin in the late 1800s. Um, T.C. Chamberlain grew up in the Beloit area, uh, attended Beloit College, uh, was on the faculty, and then actually moved to the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey, where he was the state geologist. He then moved to uh, the university to become uh, president, ended his career at, at University of Chicago. In any case, he was a geologist, and he's uh, a geologist that was one of the first folks to uh, work extensively and write extensively on artesian systems, which is what we're talking about tonight. So, um, so kind of a neat, neat story uh, associated with this project. And there's lots and lots of stories like that where the connections are strong between uh, the private colleges in, in the state of Wisconsin and the University of Wisconsin. So, okay. So I'm actually going to start with um, the little rhyme that Tom wrote in the announcement uh, for the talk. I thought it was really great. Um, he wrote, um, as is well known by Cartesians who study the hydrological lore, not all springs are artesians, um, but a spring is never a bore. I thought that was great. Um, so Wisconsin is lucky to have thousands of um, these features. And as Tom wrote, um, springs are sort of mysterious places. 
Uh, they can be spiritual places. And um, as he recalled in his description, they're special places to, to many of us. Um, so we know that they're never a bore, uh, but what are they? <laughs> um, sort of simply put, they're places where groundwater naturally flows to the Earth's surface, but does so in a fairly focused area. Okay? And um, I think they're easiest to recognize when the flow of that groundwater is relatively high and the area is relatively small. Okay? Now, as you uh, start looking at features where the flow is a little bit slower, uh, less, right, and the area is broader, then that's where there might be greater disagreement um, between you and me, what, what I might call a spring versus what you might call a spring, what I might call a seep, uh, what someone else might call a wetland uh, or a pond or even a lake. Um, so all of the features that we talk about tonight, Grace and I, I think everybody in this room uh, would agree uh, upon that, that they are springs because they, they are going to be those features that, that flow at relatively high rates. Grace will give you some, some numbers that we used in, in our work um, over, over pretty small areas. Okay? So here's the outline that we'll follow for tonight. Um, I'll start out by describing some of the contributions that springs make to the state's livelihood. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the relationship between springs and groundwater use in the state of Wisconsin. Okay, then Grace will come up and she's going to tell you a little bit more about this mapping endeavor uh, that we undertook. Um, uh, describing and mapping springs across the entire state for, uh, for about three years. Um, you'll see that once we had that distribution of large springs across the state, that really informed um, how springs form within the state of Wisconsin, why they are in some areas of the state, why they are not in other areas of the state. So we'll go, we'll go through some classes of spring systems that we've defined for this region. Okay. And then Grace will, will finish up um, and share with you some, some special spring resources in Wisconsin that you, you might be interested in. Okay, okay so, so springs contribute um, to the state's livelihood in a variety of ways. They certainly make ecological contributions. Um, they help to support uh, threatened and endangered species um, through the creation of, of uh, aquatic ha habitat. So organisms like the fairy slipper, which is um, known to exist up in the Brule River State Forest uh, in close proximity to springs there. Um, organisms like the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly, um, and, and the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly um, is an endangered species that's found um, near springs in the Mink River estuary uh, near Ellison Bay in, in Door County. Um, down in the lower right-hand corner, I've got a picture of a brook trout, and while these are not uh, threatened or endangered species, they're certainly um, organisms that many of us in Wisconsin are very interested in, and springs are really important um, to creating uh, critical habitat for our trout streams all across the state. They also make agricultural contributions. So especially in the southwestern part of the state and in the southern part of the state, it's really common to find spring houses um, that were built as European settlers um, came into this area of the world. Um, and you can see in the top picture, uh, they're still highly valued today on farms in southern Wisconsin. Um, the lower left-hand picture is from Governor Dodge uh, State Park. You can visit that particular spring house. And these were important because um, spring water tends to be very consistent in its temperature. So the uh, mean annual air temperature in, in Wisconsin is around 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. That's about what, what spring water stays throughout the year. And that's really useful, right, if you're um, a settler in this area because um, it'll keep your food stocks uh, cool in the summer, but it'll keep them from freezing in the winter as well. <laughs> 
Um, and then we've got another, another uh, uh, inhabitant of Wisconsin, common inhabitant in the lower uh, right-hand corner. So uh, even today, uh, springs are important for watering livestock in, um, uh, this was in, in Iowa County, Wisconsin. Springs in southeast uh, Wisconsin, uh, in the city of Waukesha, also enjoy a rich cultural history. They were actually marketed as restorative waters in the 1800s, and they even sparked a, a water war um, when it was proposed that Waukesha's spring waters be piped to Chicago um, in 1892 for the World's Columbian Ex Exposition. Um, this was halted in the middle of the night. Uh, it, it did not happen. Um, but you can see um, how valued the springs were at that time. It was not uncommon for elaborate um, uh, spring houses to be built over uh, the actual spring orifice, like in the, the right-hand side there. In the back of the Bethesda Spring is a hotel. And um, wealthy folks from Chicago and St. Louis would come to Waukesha to vacation and, as I said, drink the restorative waters. Um, these practices fell out of fashion around the turn of the last century. And um, there aren't any of these, these uh, really magnificent spring houses left. Um, but a very interesting history there. Uh, at that time, um, the waters were clearly making um, economic contributions to the state uh, through tourism, but the water was also bottled and sold. Uh, and then even today, there are a number of bottled water um, companies within the state of Wisconsin um, that continue to market spring water, and this is just one example, Century Springs. So for me, um, springs are really important as well because they make fantastic educational contributions. So I'm a hydrogeologist. I study groundwater um, and um, groundwater flows in the subsurface. Uh, it's, it's typically not very visible. Um, it flows very slowly. It can be hard to engage students in the study of groundwater. Um, but springs are active geologic sites. They um, are exciting to watch. As, as we noted earlier, they can be really special places, spiritual places. And so um, they're great for engaging students and getting them to think about where their drinking water comes from, because in Wisconsin, most of us rely on groundwater for our drinking water supplies. Not everybody, but, but most of the state does. Um, so they're really great for that reason. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and play this, this video here. And this was, um, was uh, shot by Grace. This is from Cata Springs in Greene County, just um, outside of Monroe, Wisconsin. And it's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> so <laughs> water just emerging from the ground. It's a little hard to get a sense of scale in this video, right? But um, this area, this spring pool, is about 10 feet by 10 feet, maybe a little bit uh, wider than that. So it's definitely meeting that criteria of a lot of water emerging naturally um, to the Earth's surface over a pretty focused area. So definitely a great way to, to get students interested in, in groundwater. OK, so now that I've got you interested in groundwater, um, we, can, <laughs> we can talk about groundwater and the water cycle. All right, and so this is a you know, highly simplified drawing, cross-section through uh, the shallow uh, part of the Earth's surface, and describes um, how, how groundwater flows through the subsurface. So not only does it flow to the surface at a spring, it flows in the subsurface. It just does so much, much slower, right? And so um, the reason it flows is because uh, there's, there's basically a budget. There are inputs, and then there are outputs. Right? The inputs come in the form of, of meteoric waters, rainwater that falls on the surface of the earth 
that infiltrates through the unsaturated zone um, and reaches the saturated zone, an aquifer. Okay? So in the brown area on the diagram, um, water infiltrates into pore spaces between sand grains. Right? Not all of those pore spaces are filled with water, partially filled with water. Um, but at some point, all the pore spaces are filled with water. The aquifer is fully saturated, and that transition is the water table. Okay? And so as long as there are areas of recharge where water goes into an aquifer, that will drive the flow of water through the aquifer, and the water will discharge to a surface water body like a lake or, or a stream. Um, now, one thing to note on this diagram, okay, is that that subsurface, the whole blue area, remember there's really pore spaces there, right? That's where the water is really flowing. Um, it's very uniform in this diagram, okay? And so to start thinking about springs and artesian flow, we need to think about a little bit less uniform materials in the subsurface. That's one of the keys uh, to produce artesian flow and also to produce springs, okay? And so in this diagram, let me get my pointer here, okay? The upper part of the diagram is very similar, really, to the last picture that I showed you. There's a very uniform aquifer, and here's the water table, right? Um, but then there's another layer of material, this uh, labeled upper confining layer, right? And then there's more uniform material at depth, okay? A thing to note um, that's sort of inherent in this diagram is that upper confining layer. We assume in this picture it's got lower permeability than the upper material and the lower material. Okay? So water doesn't uh, travel through it as, as easily. It doesn't transmit water as easily. Okay? But water can still get into that lower aquifer. right? And um, in the upper aquifer, there's a well, right? If you install a well, the water level in that well will rise to the level of the water table, okay? It'll, it'll go through the screen and the water will naturally rise to that light level, okay? If you install a well into a confined aquifer, similarly, the water will rise uh, to a level. It's not the water table, though. We call it the potentiometric surface. It's more of a pressure surface, okay? And you can see in this picture, if the land surface decreases sort of at, at a lower or at a faster rate and, and, and ends up lower than the potentiometric surface, if you install a well, that water will still try to rise up to the potentiometric surface. And if the well casing isn't tall enough, the water will naturally flow out of that well. Okay. Springs aren't that different. The big difference is that rather than having a man-made well installed into that artesian or confined aquifer, it's a natural feature that allows the water to escape and flow to the surface. Okay? And so here are some ways where that, that can happen. Okay? These are just simplified little block diagrams of different ways you might get a spring um, to form. And so on the, the, the lower two diagrams, you know, sometimes maybe that, that discontinuity in the subsurface is formed by a fault that allows water to escape a little bit more easily to the surface. Uh, sometimes maybe you've got a limestone aquifer that's fractured, and those fractures get enlarged by dissolution of, of the limestone material, and you get bigger cracks opening up, and, and those allow the water to come to the surface. Okay? Um, other times, these other two pictures show that, just like Tom said, not all springs are artesian. Sometimes springs form simply because of gravity, okay? And especially in this diagram over in the upper right-hand side, what's depicted are um, different layers of bedrock, okay? We could imagine maybe this is a sandstone and this is a shale. Again, different permeabilities. More permeable, less permeable, more permeable, less permeable. And as water infiltrates um, into the subsurface, it might hit um, a more, or I'm sorry, a less permeable layer, flow laterally, and then where those layers are truncated by a stream valley, the water can emerge as a spring. Okay? 
So either, either our teaching conditions or, or gravity sometimes, okay? All right, so how does this relate then to groundwater use? All right, so back to the simplified diagram um, with a uniform aquifer. If you install a pumping well and all other things remain the same, that is, I'm not increasing the amount of recharge infiltration into the aquifer, then if you withdraw water from a well, it's got to come from somewhere. Right? And in this picture, it's, it's showing that where it's coming from is it's basically diverting water that would otherwise discharge to that lake. Depending on the position of the well, how high it's pumping, it might even change the direction of groundwater flow and pull water from the lake into the aquifer and, and pump that water. Okay? So again, these are uniform, but if we add some interesting geology in the subsurface, the effect is basically the same on a spring. Right? You can end up depleting water um, from a spring system um, if you're using that water in different ways. Okay, this is important for the work that Grace and I were doing because um, ultimately this is what, what drove the, the beginning of the project. So, so some of you might remember back in the 1990s, uh, there was a pretty um, controversial proposal by Perrier to um, uh, develop a couple of water bottling plants near some really highly valued springs in central Wisconsin, near McCann Springs in Washera County, and then later near Big Springs in Adams County. Um, whether or not you remember that, um, it's okay. Um, but that, in combination with some other things going on in the state at that time, prompted um, the state of Wisconsin to pass legislation to broaden protection measures for groundwater, okay? And so in the state of Wisconsin, we have a groundwater protection law. And um, it's Wisconsin Statutes uh, uh, 281.34. And what it does is it requires the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources um, to consider impacts to water resources that we consider really exceptional, trout streams, but also springs. And they have to consider those impacts as permits, um, as people apply for permits for high capacity wells. Okay, so what's, what's a high capacity well? A high capacity well is a well that pumps um, about 70 gallons per minute, um, which translates to about 100,000 gallons per day or more. Okay, so these tend not to be wells that private property owners um, have uh, at their residence if they live out in the country. Okay? These um, tend to be wells that are associated with irrigation practices, um, uh, industrial uses, certainly municipal wells also qualify as, as high capacity wells too. Um, the, uh, the groundwater protection law doesn't uh, uh, address all springs. Um, the legally protected springs are those that discharge at least one cubic foot per second of water. That's about 450 gallons per minute. It's a lot of water. Um, and there's also this other criterion. They need to do that pretty consistently, 80% of the time. So there can't be huge variations, or if there are variations, it's always got to be at least one cubic foot per second. So these are the big springs, okay? Okay. So since um, the, uh, the groundwater protection law was enacted, um, there's been a lot of new high-capacity wells that have been permitted in the state of Wisconsin. Um, you can see that they're not evenly distributed across the state, um, and you can kind of get a sense of, of then what their uses might be. So a lot of high-capacity wells in central Wisconsin, um, these, are, these are largely irrigation wells, right? Um, lately, there's been a lot of, of high-capacity wells uh, permitted in north, um, northwestern Wisconsin. Um, those are more associated with industry. Okay, so, so lots of new wells um, since uh, 2004, and maybe during the Q&A we can talk more about um, uh, why there's been a lot of new wells um, uh, since 2004. Um, but in any case, this is really what prompted uh, the need for a statewide inventory. 
At the time that the groundwater protection law was passed, we didn't really have a good understanding of where the big springs in the state were. So uh, we needed some good baseline information about springs. So I'm going to turn it over to Grace right now. And she's going to come up and tell you a little bit about the inventory. Um, hi, so I'm Grace, and I had the privilege of doing most of the field work for Wisconsin's statewide springs inventory. This project was funded by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, Drinking Water, and Groundwater Use Section. We had three main goals with this inventory. One, to locate, map, and describe the large springs in the state. We defined large springs as springs flowing at least 0.25 cubic feet per second, or about 110 gallons per minute. If you aren't experienced uh, thinking in these units, I think it's worth you having an image in your head of how big these springs are. So um, you can picture two bathtubs filling up with water in one minute. The inventory includes springs that are at least that big. The second goal of our project was to create a publicly available springs database. Uh, people of varied interests, of varied disciplines, are interested in springs research. So this database can be a resource for hydrogeologists, stream ecologists, water, manage, water resource managers, etc. And our final goal was to determine the factors that contribute to the formation of springs in Wisconsin or in other words, explain geologically why they form where they do. So we had three years to map the springs in the state. We identified features from historical studies and also at the recommendation of local experts. We contacted DNR biologists, county conservationists, UW system colleagues, and we came up with an initial list of nearly 1,300 sites we thought potentially it might be large springs. And then we started making phone calls, mostly to property owners, and we narrowed that list down to 780 sites, which we visited over the course of three years. And that resulted in this map you see on the right here of 415 large springs located in 58 counties. This information right now is online, so if you're interested in seeing any of this data that we're going to present today, you can go to our website and it's linked from there. So what information were we collecting? At each spring we mapped, we took a GPS location and also marked other notes about the location, like land use or property ownership if it was public or private. We classified springs by different types, and I'll go into that in the next few slides with some pictures. Characterized the geomorphology of the site and described the substrate, so how much of the spring area was bedrock versus sand versus gravel, etc. Uh, we described different disturbances to the springs. We measured flow rate, we measured water quality, we took several photos of each spring, and we drew maps to scale that show where we did all these different measurements so that if someone's to return to these sites and survey them again, they can do measurements at the same location and the information can be comparable. Um, so let's go through some of these different attributes. Wisconsin has two main types of springs. Riocrines and limnocrines. These words are derived from Latin. Uh, rio means flowing current or flowing stream. So riocrines are springs that discharge into channels. You can see one on the left here. I'm standing at the spring head looking downstream. Limno in Latin means lake. So limnocrines are springs that discharge into lake environments. The example on the right here is a limnocrine in Waukesha County. You can see a huge um, sandy boil in the middle of the lake bed surrounded by darker organic material that's settled to the bed. Uh, limnocrines, you can often identify them by this contrast in substrate because where the spring is flowing, 
there's enough constant flow and activity that the finer organic materials are pushed away and they settle around the spring rather than, rather than on the spring. Another type of spring we have in the state are hill slope springs. These are springs that discharge down steep slopes or rock faces. This is a hill slope spring in western Iowa County. The database also includes information on spring geomorphology. So these are terms that describe the form of the spring orifice or spring opening. Seepage filtration springs flow out of unconsolidated material. In this example on the left, uh, water is flowing up as those sandy boils, but not all seepage filtration springs are these sandy boils. They also often flow out of patches of gravel or just seep out of the ground in a more diffuse fashion. Uh, fracture springs and contact springs are springs that flow right out of bedrock, either because there's a fracture in the bedrock or water is flowing preferentially through one rock layer that's more permeable than an adjacent rock layer. So in this example, behind the hammer are these layers of rock, and you can see water flowing out kind of like a sheet through one of these layers. I mentioned that we recorded different disturbances observed at sites. We noticed that nearly all of the springs um, we visited showed evidence of human presence. This just speaks to the fact that people are fascinated by springs and they've had a lot of uses historically and still today. So nearly one-fifth of the springs in the state have spring houses or other man-made structures. About one-fifth of the springs are also near uh, roadways. I'm thinking about that. Maybe that's just the springs we found um, <laughs> near roads. And also, uh, more than half of the springs are used recreationally. There's lots of hiking trails, um, fishing, hunting. So this bottom photo, there's a trail that goes around the spring. And if you look really closely, there's somebody walking their dog. <laughs> So that's what's in the database. Now Sue is going to talk about what we've learned from the inventory. OK, so um, uh, you saw the distribution of springs, all the polka dots on the map of the state of Wisconsin, right? And, and I'm not going to flip back to it right now, but hopefully you noticed that they're not evenly distributed across the state. There are some patterns here, OK? And so in order to understand this, I'm going to give you a really quick uh, geology lesson uh, for the state of Wisconsin, OK? So I think probably many of you know that um, uh, during multiple times in Wisconsin's past, uh, the landscape was covered by ice, by glaciers. The picture on the right-hand side shows the maximum extent of ice during the last major um, advance of what's known as the Laurentide Ice Sheet. Okay? And there's Dane County there for reference in southern Wisconsin. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, what I've done is I've picked out ridges of material that formed at the margins of the ice sheet, and these are called moraines. And moraines are responsible for much of the topography across the state of Wisconsin. Um, so these ridges of glacially deposited material either sort of bulldozed in front of the ice sheet or as the ice is uh, melting, the debris-rich ice, all that debris gets built up right at the margin of the ice front as well. Um, on on uh, eastern Wisconsin, uh, where the green bay lobe of ice uh, was once present, you can also see that there are some moraines that parallel the outermost moraine. Okay, and that's pretty cool because that essentially tracks the path of melting as the ice sheet was retreating from eastern Wisconsin. So there may have been times where there were sort of minor re-advances of the ice during the overall retreat of ice from, uh, from what's known as Wisconsin now. Okay? 
The other thing to notice on this, this map is that there is an area in southwestern Wisconsin where um, geologists haven't really found any evidence um, that this area has ever been covered by glacial ice. It's called the Driftless Area. Okay. So now if I plot the, some of the springs that we inventoried on this map, um, hopefully you can see that a lot of them align with these moraines, either at the base of the moraine or in between end moraines and these recessional moraines. And most of these springs look a lot like the picture in the lower right-hand corner. Um, they're rheocrenes and they have seepage filtration morphologies. Okay? And they form at that break and slope next to one of these ridges of glacial, glacially deposited materials. Sometimes the topography change alone is enough to produce the discharge of water. Sometimes there are differences in permeability associated with the glacial deposits that also enhance that focusing of groundwater. Now what I've done is I've completely stripped off all of the glacial deposits from the state of Wisconsin and we're looking at a geologic map of the bedrock. I'm not showing all of the bedrock. Um, in northern Wisconsin, the rock that's closest to the surface um, is made up of igneous and metamorphic rocks. I'm, I've grayed that out because remember from the previous slide, most of the springs that we found in northern Wisconsin are associated with the shallow glacial deposits, the, all of the sand and gravel, okay? They're not associated with the, the bedrock in that area. So while there's fascinating igneous and metamorphic bedrock, geology in northern Wisconsin, we're not going to talk about it today. Um, <laughs> instead, we're going to talk about the Paleozoic rocks. So these are sedimentary rocks, rocks like sandstone, um, shale, limestone, and dolomite. Um, and um, they, are, they range in age from about 500 million years to about 410 or so million years in age. Um, they uh, were deposited when Wisconsin was uh, sort of on a continental margin in more of a marine environment. So they reflect uh, sort of a beach environment or a shallow water environment um, a long time ago in Wisconsin's past. When you look at a geologic map like this, what you need to do is immediately start thinking about the subsurface rather than just what's expressed at the surface, okay? So if we look over at eastern Wisconsin, the rocks that are buried by the glacial deposits but the uppermost rocks, you can see there's sort of a striped pattern. Each one of the colors represents a different composition of, of bedrock. Okay? But if we go up to this little block diagram, what you really need to visualize is that these layers of rock are sort of flanking up onto this Precambrian high in northern Wisconsin. And so if we look at the surface, those layers appear as stripes. Okay? And if you're over in Milwaukee and you drill a well down through that sequence of rocks, you will eventually hit the same rocks that are exposed near the surface in central Wisconsin. Okay? Now let's go over to western Wisconsin. It's the same concept, but it's a more complicated surface pattern over here in western Wisconsin. Right? Remember, this is the Driftless area. It's heavily dissected by stream valleys. There's a lot more topography in western Wisconsin. Okay? So if we think about our block model again, first off, some of those younger units just aren't present over in western Wisconsin. Okay? But then if we take the block model and we imagine a simplified stream valley <laughs> down cutting into that block, right? then at the base of the valley, you're going to encounter older rocks. right? At the top of the valley, you're going to encounter younger rocks, right? So looking down from above at the valley, again, you see the youngest rocks at the ridge tops, and you see the oldest rocks at the base of the valley. And if you kind of follow my arrow here, that's, that's, that's what it kind of looks like over here in Grant County, right? Um, and so this is really important in understanding the types of springs that we're going to find in this part of the state. 
And what we find, so I've plotted now positions of the springs, and hopefully what you can see is that a lot of those dots are really close um, to the contact, the interface um, between the two oldest layers. Okay? Turns out that these are essentially contact or fracture springs, and they're forming just how I explained it before. Different layers, different permeabilities, lateral flow at the change in permeability, truncated by a stream valley, and you get a spring. Okay? So we're going to zoom into this area to take a closer look at that concept. This helps a little bit, probably. So, um, so here we are over, uh, what, near Crawford County, um, northern Grant County, and the oldest rocks at the bottom of the valley are primarily sandstones, and the rocks get progressively younger as we go up into higher topographic areas. So water infiltrates down from the ridge tops, and then it travels, rat, uh, travels laterally um, towards, towards the valleys. And, and these, these sandstones, they have, they have different layers in them as well. And so oftentimes what you find is that the springs actually emerge kind of like a spring line, all at roughly the same elevation corresponding to a major uh, contact between different layers of rock. Here's what they look like. Um, so even though they're emerging at the break in slope, so near uh, a steeper slope, they still often have these seepage and, and filtration morphologies because the valley bottoms in the driftless area um, are filled in with hill slope deposits and fluvial deposits, stream deposits. So sometimes the water still needs to percolate up through this unlithified material. Okay, in other places, they actually emerge right from the valley wall. Okay, okay so we, I've talked a little bit about sort of the, the physical makeup of the rocks. One of the other things that we measured out in the field had to do with the water chemistry. Um, a really easy thing to measure in the field um, is fluid conductivity. Okay. And what fluid conductivity is, it essentially measures how well the water conducts an electric current. Water conducts an electric current more effectively when there are greater concentrations of dissolved solids in the water. Okay? And so you can see um, I've now colored all of our springs associated uh, with, with sort of low to high conductance values. Okay? So you can think of the green as more dilute water and the reds as uh, greater dissolve solids. Okay? As water flows through an aquifer, um, if the flow path is long or if it's in the groundwater for a long time, it's in contact with aquifer materials for a longer period of time and it can dissolve more material from the aquifers. Okay? Um, so now we'll go back to those springs I was just talking about in western Wisconsin. And um, a lot of those dots are sort of yellow, sort of moderate conductivities. Okay, so infiltrate down through some limestones, but they spend, that water spends most of its time in contact with those sandstones, which are largely made up of quartz, which doesn't dissolve nearly as easily. So you get kind of moderate conductivity values. In the southern part of the driftless area, hopefully on the, on the lower right-hand side, you can see that there are springs that have higher fluid conductivity values. So these springs emerge from younger rocks, right? And these rocks are mostly made up of carbonate rocks, limestones and dolomites. Now, they emerge at topographic highs, higher up in the system, okay? The flow paths are arguably shorter, that water isn't, isn't in the ground very long, but again, the aquifer materials are easily dissolved, so you still get high fluid conductivity values. And we can use these fluid conductivities to discriminate other classes of springs in other places in the state as well. So we'll do that in just a couple more areas. All right. So over here in um, sort of central uh, Wisconsin, um, there's a little cluster of springs that have pretty high fluid conductivity values. Now remember, this is the part of the state that is covered by glacial deposits. Okay. However, 
really high fluid conductivity values. And what's going on here is that streams have downcut through the glacial deposits into the uppermost bedrock unit. And that bedrock unit is a limestone. Okay? And here are some of the pictures of what these springs look like. There, there are several of these really beautiful springs right around um, a Green Lake. This is actually Green Lake in this little inset map. Okay? And then over in eastern Wisconsin, um, there's another suite of springs where we can classify. Now, notice the other ones that I've shown you, they've all had similar specific um, conductance values. In this diagram, hopefully you can see that all of the dots are different. <laughs> some are yellow, some are red, some are even green. So the fact that there is variation, wide variation, in fluid conductivity is actually interesting. Okay? And so these are all associated with the youngest bedrock in the state of Wisconsin. Um, it's Silurian in age, and it's a dolomite. It's heavily fractured. Okay? So water zips through this aquifer along the fractures. If there's been a large rain event, then the water um, that discharges at a spring might actually reflect rainwater more so than, aqua, than water that has been in contact with the aquifer for a long time. If it hasn't rained for a long time, the water discharging at the spring, first off, the flow might, might be much lower, right? Um, but also, the conductivity is likely to be higher because that water now has been in contact with the aquifer materials for a longer period of time. Okay? So all along uh, the, the um, eastern part of Wisconsin um, and uh, the springs associated with the Silurian dolomite, um, we find springs with variable flow rates and variable fluid conductivities. And they look a little bit like, like the pictures in, the, in the, the bottom there. Okay, Grace. All right, so... In our description for this talk, we tried to lure you in by asking, uh, where are the largest springs in the state? And this map here is sort of your answer. We've, we spent three years trying to find the biggest springs in Wisconsin, and the average flow rate of all 415 springs we mapped is 0.96 cubic feet per second, going back to the unit of bathtubs. That's <laughs> eight bathtubs filling up with water in one minute. And those geologic settings that Sue described all produce springs that are well above this mean. So there are large springs in all regions of the state. The biggest spring we found was in Door County, somewhere up here, um, on private property, at a flow rate of 18 cubic feet per second I don't know how many bathtubs that is, but I Googled it this morning, and that's three cement mixer trucks filling up in one minute. A huge spring, but it's part of that Silurian dolomite system, so it, the flow is really variable, and the day we visited it happened to be after a large rain event. The spring with the highest and consistently highest flow we found on public property is in southwest Dane County not too far from here, near Mount Vernon. And the spring with the largest surface area we found was McCann Springs in Washera County in central Wisconsin. Here are some photos of these sites. This is Big Spring in Donald Park, which is a county park in Dane County. Flow rate of 8.7 cubic feet per second, or 75 bathtubs a minute. It's huge. You can see um, this sandy area here. This is about 50 feet wide, and there are big sandy boils covering the whole bed of that pool. Um, this is a site, I think, all the times I've visited it, there have been other people at the park. So um, it's pretty well loved. This is a photo of the same site in the 1890s. It was well loved back then, too. Um, the first. European settlers to come to this area built their cabin right next to this spring. And over the course of the next few decades, the town of Mount Vernon was founded, and the town regularly held picnics here, as depicted in this photo. Springs have been valued 
by people for um, much longer than just from dating back to the 1890s. And on our website, we have an interactive map where you can click around, look at springs, and learn about some of their histories. Here's a screenshot of the application. You can scroll down, see photos, read different accounts of how springs have affected Wisconsin lives as uh, vital resources and spiritual places to American Indians, as central features to some of the state's first farmsteads and towns, and as important water sources to our trout streams. So if you're interested in this history, go to our website and explore this site. This is a photo of McCann Springs, that spring uh, that we surveyed with the largest surface area. The spring is located just east of the Johnstown Moraine. So this ridge you see here wraps around the spring area, and water is just seeping out from all sides of the moraine, forming this beautiful sandy channel you see here. McCann Springs is a significant place with a significant history, and it was actually the site um, that Perrier proposed tapping and bottling water from in the late 1990s. At that time, people of various backgrounds um, with different stakes in keeping this spring area flowing and healthy uh, united in opposition to their proposal. And the controversy around this site actually um, prompted Wisconsin's Groundwater Protection Act, which in turn prompted uh, our project today of finding other large springs in the state and describing their hydrogeology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I did turn this on. Oh, good. Thanks, Sue, and thanks, Grace. And now we'll take uh, questions from, and I'll just leave it up to them to pick you guys out, but I'll try to get out of the way. Any questions? Ah, over here. You bring back? Yeah. Are trout streams, are the big stream, big springs and small springs, are they all have trout in them? So the question is, um, uh, do all of the springs, whether they're big or small, um, have trout associated with them? And um, no, they don't. <laughs> so um, most of the trout streams in uh, Wisconsin are in southwestern Wisconsin, most of the high quality, the, the class one trout streams, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, I, th I think it would be a stretch to even say that there is one of these big springs on every one of those trout streams. So there are far more trout streams than there are large springs in the state. Okay, so that's, that's sort of one way to think about it. Um, another way, though, to, to think about it is that sometimes there isn't that discontinuity in the aquifer to produce that focused flow, right, and produce a large spring like the ones that we've described today. However, the overall aquifer system still produces consistent flows of water and cold water that help sustain the trout streams. So, um, so the overall system contributes, I would say, to all the, all the streams, but they don't all have a big spring. <laughs> yes? How many springs have been incorporated into uh, the municipal water supply? Oh, in, in the, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Um, so the question was, um, how many springs in Wisconsin are used for public water supplies? Um, to my knowledge, Springs in Wisconsin don't produce enough water to actually be used for a public water supply system. I know of one site in the Driftless area. Um, I think it's in Grant County near Lancaster. That might, but. Mm -hmm. I think Mill Spring here in Madison mm. is part of the municipal water supply. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. Yes. Uh, are you aware of any springs that have dried up uh, around the area that used to be 
springs, you know. I, I'm guessing a lot of them because of the building and stuff that dried out. Yeah, so if you remember... the question. Oh, the question is, are there springs in the state that have dried up? Um, if you remember earlier in my uh, part of the presentation, we investigated nearly 1,300 sites that we thought might be large springs, and we made phone calls to people. And a lot of the responses um, we, we received was that there wasn't a spring there anymore. Mm -hmm. Or it had diminished in flow and would no longer qualify for our inventory. So there was a, an effort back in the 1950s um, by the Wisconsin Conservation Department. That's the precursor to the uh, Department of Natural Resources today. Um, this was between 1956 and about 1960 or so, and, and there was this effort to, to survey springs across the state. Um, and they, they did about two-thirds of the counties in Wisconsin, and the primary purpose of those surveys was to evaluate the springs for, um, for fish rearing purposes. And so um, that that those studies constitute most of the historical data that we had um, on, on springs. And, and that's what Grace is referring to. You know, we sort of compared back to those records from the 1950s, and, and some of those springs, um, there, there wasn't any, any evidence of them existing today. Now, whether that's due to groundwater pumping or um, infilling and development, um, that would be on a sort of a site-specific basis. Oh, okay. No, I won't point. You point. <laughs> yep, right here. Uh, just a follow-up to that. It seems like there are lots of high-capacity wells that have been uh, drilled in the last yeah. 15 years. And what is the impact of those on the, the groundwater and on the drying up of springs uh, in general? And what's the long-term picture uh, as we move forward? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, you know, I, I showed you this map of all of the high-capacity wells that have been drilled in the state. Uh, what is uh, the potential impact of, of new high-capacity wells on, on springs across Wisconsin? Um, in uh, sort of the central part of Wisconsin, where many of the new high-capacity wells have been installed, um, there actually are fewer large springs in that part of the state because of the local geology. However, there, um, there have been impacts to surface water features in that area of the state um, to, to streams um, in, in the area. Um, in terms of the, the sort of the long-term impact, you know, looking forward, what, what might we expect? So every spring is special. Right, and it's, <laughs> I, mean, I mean that, uh, you know, literally in that um, you really need to understand the specific controls on why the water is emerging at that particular location. And so with a better understanding of the precise groundwater flow path, you can answer a question like that for a specific spring because then you can couple that with information on the well. How deep is the well drilled? Uh, what's the spatial distance um, from, from the spring head? Um, what's the pumping rate of the well? So it, it, it does become kind of a site-specific question, spring by spring. Right here. How do you measure the uh, amount of water coming out of these wells, uh, especially since they're uh, diffused or dispersed and there's a lot of turbulence and so forth? Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we measure the flow from the wells or the springs? The springs. The springs. Okay. You want to answer that one? Uh, different ways. Uh, if the channel is wide enough, we have a meter that we uh, plop in the channel. So you make a cross section of the channel, measure velocity at different points, and grab a volume of water um, over time. At some of the sites, it's tricky to measure, like those springs that are trickling right out of bedrock. There were a few where I just took a bucket and caught water at each of those little trickles and timed how long it took to fill up four <laughs> gallons or however, whatever tick mark I chose. So you have to be creative sometimes. Yeah. Uh, especially in the, in the streams, like wild rose a year or two ago, 
in the, in the streams that are in there's just a number of springs in the stream itself, but they were precisely brown, just fine sand boiling up, and it was just a precisely brown circle. They're either a foot wide, three feet wide, and something like that. Uh, why would they be so precisely brown? Okay, so the question is sometimes with, I think, these seepage filtration springs, the ones with the boiling sands, um, that the, the sandy area is really round, okay, and, and why would it be so round? Um, I would guess in a, in a spring like that, that whatever that, that preferential pathway for groundwater is to emerge at that location, that it's probably pretty discreet, okay? So it may not be, like, you know, the pictures that I showed of, of the spring lines, right? That's associated maybe with a fracture that um, is long, right? Um, in a case like that, maybe, maybe it's not a feature like that. Maybe it's a, um, a fracture that isn't as wide, right? So most of the water is really emerging at one location. And that's where the water is moving the fastest, right? And that's where it di displaces the most material. And then the velocity of the water diminishes as it moves away from that central point. And that, that creates that circular shape as those particles get, the sand particles get deposited away from the fastest moving water. Yeah, in back. A uh, couple of questions. Were you able to determine the uh, levels of contaminants from agricultural processes that uh, appeared in the spring water. Also, did you uh, do historical surveys of Milwaukee County to determine where significant artesian upwellings were? Okay, so the first question has to do with, um, did we do any additional water quality sampling to determine um, agricultural impacts to some of these springs? Um, and then we'll get to the Milwaukee County question, too. Do you want to talk about the reference springs, maybe? Yeah, so something we didn't present today, but that we're doing at the geological survey, is we're monitoring eight springs in the state. And there, we're doing a more detailed chemical profile of the spring water. And we're sampling them quarterly right now, four times a year. And of the eight, six of them show signs that agriculture has affected the water. Um, we didn't do full profile of the springs in the inventory, though. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the other things that we're now just starting on those reference sites is we're starting to look more closely at, uh, at the aquatic habitat in terms of the organisms that are living in, um, in these springs. So uh, we're doing vegetation surveys and also surveys of the macroinvertebrates that live in the spring pools. And, um, and both of those types of organisms can also be um, indirect indicators of, of things like agricultural impact as well. So we, so we don't quite have that information yet, uh, but we're on it. Um, so this, the second question had to do with Milwaukee County. Did, did, did we work in Milwaukee County? What did we find in, in Milwaukee County? Um, uh, we we uh, evaluated all of the counties in Wisconsin. Um, we could flip back to the map, but I believe we didn't find any springs in Milwaukee County, presumably due to the level of development that um, exists throughout that, that county. Yeah, we didn't visit any either. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, over here? Yeah. Right here. One back. <laughs> then we'll get to what you. What can you tell us about the spring that's in the Arboretum here in Madison near Monroe Street? Oh. Mm -hmm. Did you end up going to it? Yeah, I did. Okay. So the question, the question is, uh, what, what can we um, tell all of you about the spring that is uh, located just off of Monroe Street um, in the UW Arboretum. Well, you, uh, Sue is the expert on oh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> the hydrogeologic <laughs> controls of springs I'll, in Madison. Okay, okay. So, um, so a lot of the springs in Madison, I didn't show all of the different <laughs> classes that we identified. Um, from this study, and there, there are a number of springs in and around the Madison area. And 
Um, most of the springs, um, including the springs at, at the UW Ar Arboretum, um, uh, imagine, well, let's go back to the, that cross section from the driftless area, actually. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so, um, you know, what's, what's fascinating about this part of the state is that we have um, topography that is as uh, beautiful and dramatic as what exists in the driftless area. It's just that it's all infilled with glacial deposits. And so we don't see the, it's true. Um, so we don't see these, these lovely ravines. Um, and um, yet, yet you could visualize infilling this diagram with material, okay? Um, and then similar um, pathways for groundwater exist. right? Because it's sort of the same configuration of bedrock in the subsurface. So infiltration through glacial deposits, through um, mostly horizontal bedrock in this part of the state, and then lateral movement of that groundwater. And then that water, uh, it, 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 a valley can still sort of truncate that pathway. Okay, and then the water needs to move upward through thin glacial deposits. Okay, so we think most of the springs in and around the Madison area um, are formed this way, um, including including the springs over by the Arboretum. Yes. Is much of spring water potable, and if so, is that in certain parts of the state, perhaps in less settled or populated? Uh, or more wilderness areas like northeastern Wisconsin? Yeah, great question. So the question is, um, you know, oftentimes uh, spring waters are sort of viewed to be especially pure. Um, but in this case, you know, the question is just, are, you know, is it potable water? Is it okay to drink the water? Um, my recommendation, um, if, you, if you find a beautiful spring, uh, whether it's in a, a park or you're hiking up in northern Wisconsin, is maybe don't drink the water. Um, uh, the, and the reason for that is that um, um, many of the springs, especially those in the glaciated part of the, of the state, uh, the, you know, the, the water really hasn't been in, in uh, the groundwater system very long. Okay, so subsurface materials do a wonderful job of filtering out um, contaminants um, and producing very, very high quality drinking water uh, within the state of Wisconsin, um, especially when we pump that water from our deep sandstone aquifer um, throughout the state. Okay, um, but when you, when you um, find water that, that hasn't been in the system as long, it hasn't been run through that filter as long, um, it, th there's, there's a sort of lower potential for, for filtering, okay? So there's that aspect. And, you know, until you get it tested, you don't really, you don't really know. So it never has been the case where uh, spring water is more drinkable than it is now? I no, mean, I think, I think probably... A couple hundred years ago, people... Yeah, yeah, so, so then the question is, you know, well, but, you know, has this changed through time? And, and I'd say, yeah, it probably has changed through time because our land use is so different um, than it was uh, when, at least when European settlers first came, you know, to this area, right? And prior to that, certainly. Um, so in that case, um, yeah, some of, those, some of those springs, you know, would be a little bit safer to, to take a chance on. The other thing to keep in mind is that, um, and we didn't emphasize this very much, but um, certainly, people are drawn to springs. A lot of wildlife is also drawn to springs, and um, and so a lot of wildlife hang out around <laughs> springs. And and so there may be surface contamination, not the groundwater contamination. Yeah. Yeah. Way in back. Uh, yeah, did you uh, analyze the chemicals like radium? Uh, that's sometimes in drinking water, but did you find it in spring water? Yeah, good question. So the, the question is, did we analyze any of the spring waters for uh, things like radium? And no, we did, we did not do that. Um, uh, as Grace mentioned, uh, we, we really just uh, uh, did um, sort of field measurements for water quality at all of the sites that we visited, all the, the 400 and and 15 sites, so things like 
the electrical conductance, the specific conductivity, pH, um, temperature. Um, and then we did a fuller suite of sort of major cations and anions at these reference springs that Grace talked about, but we haven't done any sampling for things like radium. And we, and we don't have plans to do that either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your uh, web tool. Are you able to give us the URL? If you, um, you oh, uh, this question is how do we find the web tool, the map? Um, go to just Google WGNHS for Wisconsin Natural His Geological and Natural History Survey, and there's a tab there for springs. Click the tab, and the information's all there. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you came up with about 400 and some big springs. Do you have any kind of guess of how many springs there are? Are there thousands? You don't have not classifying as big, all springs? So, so the question is, we, we documented uh, 415 springs that discharge at rates of at least 0.25 CFS or greater. Do we have any idea of how many other springs um, are out there? Um, so first off, um, you know, we didn't, we, we didn't gain access to all of the sites that uh, we, request, we, we requested access um, to. Um, we, did a, we, we, uh, we gained access to most of the sites, uh, the vast majority. Um, so we know that there's a few other you know, larger springs um, that, that we know about, right, that we weren't able to document. Um, we think it's possible that we just missed a few, too. Um, I guess that's possible. Um, there's certainly lots and lots of other smaller springs that exist in the state. That's a hard question to answer because I think now we're getting into that area of dis disagreement um, regarding what you call a spring and what I call a spring. So the lower the flow, the broader the area, it gets a little bit harder to agree on, on whether or not we're going to call it a spring. Um, so kind of a wishy-washy answer, huh? Yeah. But a nice one. Thousands? Yeah. How's that? <laughs> Would you join me in thanking Sue and Grace?